everybody, I'm Tom Vassell, and today's Board Gate Breakfast is being brought to you from Dice Tower West, which is, it's like very early in the morning right now, so there's not a ton of people here, but I promise you it is quite crowded. It is Saturday morning as I record this. So you might be sad and saying, I wish I was there. You're right. It's a little late if you're watching this. If you were there and you're watching this, thanks for coming. And if you want to come, good news. Dice Tower Retreat and Dice Tower East are both open. Dice Tower East is first, of course. That's coming up this July. There's only a few hotel rooms left and tickets. So if you want to check that out, that's at Dice Tower East. At Dice Tower Retreat, which is our huge library for like 150, 200 people. So if you want to come to that, both of those you can find at their respective websites. So we're back to normal here for a while. It's pretty exciting. We got some cool stuff coming out this week, some reviews and things, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But first, let's talk about the Internet. Okay, so this week I'm talking about Facebook. Yes, the whole website. Actually, there's multiple groups on Facebook, and if you're not part of them, I'm inviting you to join them. We have the Dice Tower itself, a group which people talk all about board games and things like that. We have Dice Tower East, West, Retreat, Cruise. Those are different ones you can join. And Facebook's kind of an interesting beast. I know a lot of people, maybe you include it, you hate Facebook. And I can understand why people aren't a big fan of, you know, folks showing either the food they ate that day and or their political beliefs and shoving them down their throat, what have you. But there's some cool things, and groups are interesting. You could join Facebook, have no friends at all, and join some groups and go in there because groups are moderated. So like the Dice Tower group, we moderate it. I'm, I have a whole team of people who go through it, and we moderate it because in a lot of groups, especially board game groups, Kickstarter people want to jump in and tap their Kickstarter every few seconds. And there are some groups that do that. So if you want to see those, you can. There's also people who want to stick in memes of cats in boxes. And as we all know, that's one of the seven deadly sins. So those kind of things can get moderated out. Now, of course, there's people who want more moderation. Someone might make a joke and then uh, you think that's inappropriate or something, you know, or you think the moderation's too strict. But I think the moderation's just right because, well, I do it. But at the end of the day, we want people to have a good time. And I found that I'm enjoying the Facebook groups more and more. I use them more than, say, you know, just regular Facebook itself because it's, it's more concentrated. There's a lot of Facebook groups out there. There's one about Kickstarters called Kickstarters Best Practices. There's, um, there's some for reviewers to get together. There's publisher groups. There's all sorts of different groups. Companies have their own groups where often they will publish news there and not even on their own website. So I'm not touting Facebook as the greatest thing. There's a lot of problems with Facebook for sure. But it's something I'm finding very enjoyable. And if you want to meet and talk to other people in the Dice Tower network itself, that's a good place to go. Even I pop in occasionally, not tremendously often, but I come in and look at the different things that are there. And it's a fun place to talk to people like-minded. Before Facebook really became big, the only place really to talk to people, there's essentially three main ones, and that's Board Game Geek, which is fine, and Reddit, which is Reddit. And Facebook is now, I think, a, another place. And Facebook, again, is kind of a wild, wild west, but in these specifically moderated forums, you can have a lot of fun. So I invite you to check those out. Just look for Dice Tower and join one of our groups. Today, we are reviewing Die Hard, the Nokatami Heist. Nokatami? Nokatami Heist board game. Inspired by the movie. So this game is an all against one game. So one person is the hero, John McClane, and everybody else are the bad guys. And there's three acts to this game that unfold as you play. Each act, John McClane will have three objectives he needs to complete and then get to a certain square to move on to the next act. The thieves will also have three objectives, which are optional in completing, but if they complete them, it will help them unlock the safe. There is a grid of numbers that the thieves need to cover up using their cards and by completing their objectives to unlock the safe. If they do that, then they will win the game. Or if John McClane runs out of cards to play from his action pile, he will also lose the game, and the thieves will win. When's your final well, thoughts I, okay. on it? I enjoyed my plays of this game, and I would say that if 
you're a big fan of Die Hard and you're more of a casual gamer, you probably would really enjoy this because it does, we play this with someone who really does like Die Hard a lot. John is a big fan of Die Hard too. Um, and really got into role playing and <laughs> being the characters and having a fun time. Yeah. <laughs> the rules are not that complicated. Most if you're if you're buying this game and you're not in the Die Hard and you're simply buying it for the the mechanisms that are in the game, it's not that strong of a game. Like right. Like if you're not in not it for the Die Hard IP, I think you could probably pass on this game because the IP brings a lot of the fun to it, and once you play through once, it's not that the, the acts don't change, the objectives don't change, they're always going to be the same, because mm -hmm. it's based off the movies. If you look at yourselves, and let's be honest, most of the games are on yourselves, you've only played once in the past two years, and you really like Die Hard, then you should still check it out, because I think... You'd want to play this once a year, probably around Christmas time. Yeah, it's a great Christmas game. We don't have any Christmas board games. <laughs> no. I think this is the best Christmas board game. Yeah. If we have someone over and they like Die Hard, I would play this over a lot of other board games that people consider gateway games. I don't know if this yeah. is a gateway game to get people into the hobby, but this is a great game to play with people who aren't really gamers, and but like Die Hard. And yeah. be like, hey, you like this theme. This is a very specific theme, and it does it well. So if you'd like to check out a more in-depth review of Die Hard, go ahead and check out my YouTube channel, Almost a Board Gamer. And thanks for watching The Dice Tower. Bye! Hi, I'm Jordan. Let's talk about player pieces and games. A pawn refers to a player piece. They're usually pretty abstract like this, but you could refer to any kind of player piece as a pawn. Uh, but usually when somebody is referring to a pawn, they're kind of referring to a piece that kind of looks like this. The term meeple comes from carcassonne, uh, means miniature people. So anything with this little wooden uh, person shape is usually referred to as a meeple. Anything that has little wooden resources, they also tack meeple on the end of it because, you know, people think that's cute. This is a standee. A standee is usually a piece of cardboard with some artwork on it depicting the character. It has a little plastic base that stands on the game board or the table like that. So it's got some artwork on it, but again, it's usually a two-dimensional piece of cardboard. Miniatures are usually uh, plastic molded pieces that have a lot more detail. They're usually three-dimensional. They kind of look like action figures that you get to play around in your game with. Available. What about this one? I did it. These are all the. What's this? This is Tom's game. That's some games down here. Should I, should I just forget it and do your own? How am I supposed to do that in the allotted time you give me? Oh, yeah? You do it. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'll do it. So, in essence, this game is great for the splice top. 
So in essence, this game is greater. Well, Paul, you know that. Well, Paul, you know that when you have to play. We You know, between you and me, I think the guy's a bit loopy. What all those dumb hats? For all of you people that didn't get this yet, yes, this is a joke. I love Tom. He invited me down for a 24-hour marathon. I mean, <clears throat> I'm blessed, right? Yeah, it's hard work. And yeah, we've got constraints and time limits, but that's just the way it goes. And I'm sure every one of the contributors feels exactly the way I feel. Well, I hope so. You know what? Thanks to everybody who comments. Makes me happy. And, uh, thanks! Hi folks, I'm Andy from Portable Gaming and welcome to my new segment, Change of Venue, in which I talk about different board game franchises I love that I also think would work really well in new media. So the first game I want to talk about is Fireteam Zero. A fantastic one to four player cooperative horror game in which you play the titular Fireteam Zero, a special force as a unit in World War II set out to take on supernatural entities and powerful artifacts to stop them from destroying the planet. This game is excellent, it is tense, it is really, really difficult. It uses really cool card play mechanic and unique power abilities to try and complete various different objectives with continuously respawning enemies so the pressure never lets up. And I think this game would work really well in the world of video games. Now, some of you might automatically think like an XCOM style game is what this would need, but I think this would be better suited in the wheelhouse of Left 4 Dead. Now, for those of you who never played Left 4 Dead, it was a one to four player cooperative zombie shooting game in which you went through the same levels each time, but with dynamic AI changing the patterns of the monsters, the enemies, even the weather, to try and mess it up every time. So no matter how many times you played that level, each experience was unique. And I feel this would work really well for Fire Team Zero, but more updated for the modern era. Fireteam Zero's characters all have special abilities, which would fit really well within the modern class-based player games like they have. The various different types of objectives mean you have loads of different level variety. Some levels might be a dungeon crawl, some might be an open map where you've got to find the right artifact. Some would be horde mode as you battle against waves of enemies while one NPC tries to complete a ritual. Also, the game shipped with three different races in the core box, two in the expansion boxes, and various boss characters, meaning there's tons of enemy variety for you to try and battle and combat. And I just think it would be a really cool, atmospheric and interesting take on that style of game. But what do you think? Let me know down in the comments below what you thought, if you've played any of those games, if you play the game I've pitched to you, if there's any games you think I should cover and what you thought of this segment. Anyway folks, as always, I've been Andy, and it's still your round. Okay, so what's coming from the Dice Tower this week? Well, honestly, haven't a clue. You know, we have our library here with all the games. I'll re be reviewing some games this week. I'm not sure what yet. Now, I can tell you some things that are happening this week. Live board game breakfast. We're going to be posting one of the top tens that we recorded here at Dice Tower West, as long as it gets recorded well and sounds okay. And it will probably be me versus Rado, Richard Hamm, uh, are the top ten uh, most influential games from the past decade. But we'll have to wait and see. Uh, if that works out well, but at, that will probably go up this week. And if not, there's some really great top tens you probably have missed over the past few weeks. We're also going to be doing crowd surfing on Wednesday. They'll be live board game breakfast on Thursday live. And um, I, there might be more stuff coming too. 
Check our schedule. Watch our YouTube channel. And, of course, the podcasts. There's all kinds of cool podcasts. We're going to be announcing some new podcasts being added to the network very soon. So stay tuned for that. And let's keep going. Howdy, folks. Welcome to By the Numbers. My name is Hunter Thomason from the Family Showdown. This week on By the Numbers, playing a game with everyone. I did a little math magic, and I figured it out. But, this might not be completely correct. And I challenge all you math nerds to find a more efficient way. I'm assuming that we're playing exclusively four-player games. I took eight people. What would it take for eight people at a maybe a game night to play a game with everyone else? And the first thing I figured out, the most efficient way to do this is everyone to pair off in twos. So here we have an advanced simulation of an eight-player game night. So they start off in groups of four, and then they move in units of two around and play with people they haven't played with yet. And we see that a total of six games were needed for everyone to play a game with everyone else. So I came up with a formula to calculate how many games it would take for a group of people, using the previous assumptions I made, to play a game with everyone else at that gathering. So let's crank it up a notch and look at the Dice Tower Cruise. It had about 800 people, a little more. We're going to make it 800 for math reasons. And we see with our little handy-dandy formula that it would take about 79,800 games for everyone to play a game with everyone else. That's 399 sessions of 200 games going on at the same time for everyone to play a game with each other. To put that in perspective, let's say each game takes about a half hour. It would take about 8.3 days non-stop gaming for everyone to play a game with everyone else. So the moral of the story, if you want to play a game with everyone at a gathering, you need to go to small gatherings. Hi, everybody. Hello, I'm Ryan. And I'm Bethany. And we are Ryan and Bethany Board Game Reviews. All right, today we're going to be talking about quirky circuits. Uh, normally, we talk about what's going on with our health lives as well, but we've currently been just getting over the flu, so uh, we'll let you <laughs> pass on that this week. I've slept so much, you guys. So much. Sarcasm <laughs> abounds. Um, but quirky circuits, this is a full cooperative game where you are programming these cute little robots to go around this book, which is your board. Uh, there's a bunch of different scenarios. Uh, however, the cards are not played face up, they're played face down. So you don't really know what other people are playing on your team. And it may result in some really wacky scenarios where your robot is just all over the board doing crazy stuff. It's a lot of fun. Very quirky. I really, really enjoyed this game. I don't think I've laughed so much playing a game like this ever. I just think, like, the first time we played it, we were kind of upset with each other because we're just like, why can't you figure out what I'm trying to do here and why are you messing with my plans. Once we got over ourselves, this game was so much more enjoyable and we just laughed so much as the robots were doing the things we didn't want them to do because we were misinterpreting what the other person was trying to do and it was just, it was fun. It was so much fun. Yeah, it was like if the mind and Robo Rally had a weird baby <laughs> anyways this is a lot of fun guys we recommend it uh, this is a great family game if you want to check out our full review be sure to go to our youtube or our facebook page we are ryan and bethany board game reviews all right well this is ryan and i'm bethany hoping you have a happy healthy breakfast bye everybody bye, guys. I, i'm not a huge you know i love dice tower west Vegas is a tough place for me to come to because I don't drink, smoke, womanize, or gamble much. And that's what's here. I shouldn't say much. It sounds like I, I womanize a little. No. But anyway, um, the, uh, so there's shows, quite expensive. There's food. <clears throat> Anyhow. But there's one thing I do every time I come to Vegas, and that's go to the fountains at the Bellagio. Which, for some reason, when I'm there, even though there's a crowd of people, some very odd people behind me, and some guys trying to get me to do things which are somewhat lewd, um, on the other corner, I get taken out of where I'm at and transported. It sounds stupid, but it's true. If you ever come to Vegas, definitely check the Bellagio Fountains. They go off at night at different times. They play music, and it's the same thing. And I've seen the same show sometimes, multiple times. But it's just magnificent, I think. And takes you to another world. So that's my review of something else this week. Very short, but it's cool. And let's keep going. 
What's up everyone? My name is Melissa McCack and this is Smashing Buttons and Slamming Cards. This is a segment where I talk about a video game I love and I connect it to a board game I love. And this week I want to talk about Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. I adore this game. It is puzzly where you're trying to figure out, okay, what should I shift around in order to unlock this room? What kind of weapons or armor do I need in order to get through whatever it is you're trying to get through? It is one of your older classic RPG style games and I love it. I'd like to connect that to Tiny Epic Quest. I think this was a no-brainer. It was pretty much a given because a lot of people have compared it to this game simply for uh, aesthetic reasons a lot of it but there's other things going on that also remind me of the Legend of Zelda world where you are going through temples just like in Ocarina of Time and a lot of Legend of Zelda stuff you are I find the game to be puzzly right you're trying to figure out okay where can my meeples go to uh, do that sort of formation that the quest is asking me to do but also get the most out of that formation do I want to get through the temples do I want to beat up on goblins what kind of weapons do I want? It's really cool. I love it. It's a lot of fun and I've been having a blast with it. Anyway, that's it for this week. Thank you so much for watching. If you like, you can check out mine and my brother's podcast called Room 51. We are collaborating with Jordan from Jordan Plays Blue. So that's been exciting. I'll see you all next time. Hey, you invited me to play your game. I'm not playing it with you. That seems kind of rude, right? Uh, one of the things I found here, I meet this at conventions, is I get offered people to join a game all the time. And I have the willpower to say no, and that, again, sounds mean, but I love playing games with people. Every time I come to con, I play with more people each time, I think. Especially Dice Tower West, I play with maybe 50 to 100 different people so far, and it's been great. But I just won't play a game that I think is okay or I don't like. And you say, how could you be so mean and rude to not play those games? I just don't think it's fun. There are so many fantastic games in the world. And I'll, I've had fun playing bad games, testing bad games with people. And it didn't matter if the game was bad because the group is great. That's fantastic. But I don't know that I should go out of my way to do that. I don't want to go out of my way to play a game just to make somebody else happy. Now, I suppose if my wife loved the game and I disliked it, I would make the exception there. And I definitely have made such exceptions with my kids. But even then, there's something that I think we could both really like. And that's how I feel. We have a library here of 1,500, 1,600 games. I can't remember anymore. The fact is, I, there's several of them I don't like, and there's several of them that I don't think are that great. I put them there because I know other people will enjoy them. But if I get asked to play it, I don't feel any kind of you must play this game or you're a jerk. No, I'm just like, oh, I'll pass. Someone else will play that game. And or maybe we can find a game that both of us like. Just like, and here's the flip side, I don't want anyone else to play a game that I think they won't like. I think this is one of the biggest problems that we have as gamers sometimes is we try to force games on other people and we say, I know that once you play this, you'll like it. I know that you have hated every dice chucking game you've ever played, but this is the one. I know you don't like war games, but this is the one. And in reality, we don't care if they'll like it or not. We just want them to play it. We're like hoping to like convert them to the game we like. And it's just not going to happen. And they'll play it. They might even like it a little bit. But we've kind of put them in that position where they have to play it. So I feel that if I invite someone to play a game and they're like, yeah, I don't like that kind of game, then I say, all right, no harm, no foul and we move on to the next. And I know this is tough when you just bought that $250 Kickstarter and your game group doesn't want to play it. To that, I might say, check with them before you back the Kickstarter. Or go find someone else who will, because there are people who will play pretty much anything. And that's what I'm thinking. It's kind of convoluted and all over the place, but I think that we should, the cool thing about gaming is there's definitely a game here that whoever you are, all of you watching, every single one of you, there's one game that we both like. I've met people and we have really very differences and we, we have so many different things that we disagree on, but there's one game probably that we both enjoy. And that's what's fantastic about gaming. Happy breakfast, everyone. This week, I'm gonna to talk to you about 5211, the small card game that's soon gonna have sort of the Azul re-theming. Now, the game has very little theme, so it's really just 
an art retake. Um, now, this is important because there were two major flaws for me with the original. One was the artwork. The colours were just too similar, which meant that really it was hard to tell some apart. And uh, certainly in some lighting, you really weren't sure what colours were played. And that was that's really sort of important for the gameplay. The other element of the game that I really didn't get on with was the amount of sort of effort and admin that you're having to do to play the game. Every turn you are playing cards, picking cards up. Now this sounds like not too much, but to play a total of, you know, you have a five cards, you're playing four cards in a round. You've got to keep remembering to keep picking up, play cards, counting, working out, playing card, pick up card, play card, pick up card. It's just, it didn't give you enough time to enjoy between all of the admin I found. I found like you were constantly doing as much outside of playing the game than playing it. And that didn't quite work out. So I don't think the theme would help, but it will at least make the game playable, which is definitely an improvement. Anyway, that's 5211, and I'm Oliver Reese, signing out. Well, hi, everybody. I'm Doug Jr. from Doug and Doug Gaming, and don't worry, Doug the Third will be back soon. But for right now, you are watching a Fellowship of Meeples. So this week in our gaming group, we had some new people, which is always exciting. In fact, we ended up with a group of eight that kind of wanted to stick together. So I had to figure out what could we play all together. And I came up with something that was perfect. It's called Welcome To. Welcome To is a roll and write game, or more specifically, a flip and write game that was designed by Benoit Turpin and published by Deepwater Games. There's not enough time during this video for me to teach you how to play Welcome To. There are already some great videos that do that. Instead, I'd like to tell you five reasons why I highly recommend Welcome To for your game group. Number one, it has simultaneous turns. You don't have to wait till the person's done. Everybody takes a turn at the same time. Number two, it literally plays as many people as you want it to play. Really, all you need to do is make sure everyone has a game sheet and that everyone can see the cards. And if you don't have enough game sheets, you can even go to the game's website, download one, and print some out. Number three, it's an easy game to teach and to learn. I'm not saying it's the easiest game to teach and to learn, but it's fairly easy. And we had some newbies the other night, and they learned this just fine, and we all had a great time playing it. Number four, there are several variations available for this game. So if you don't like the standard neighborhood, there are several variations that you can purchase online. And number five, even though this is an easy game to teach and to learn, it's highly strategic. Not a lot of luck involved other than the flip of the card, but what you do with those items and those numbers, it's all up to you. It's a very thinky game. So if you haven't had a chance to try out Welcome To, I highly recommend it. Well, that's it for this week's episode of A Fellowship of Meeples. We'll see you next time on Board Game Breakfast. Until then, have a great week. And that's it for another Board Game Breakfast. We'll see you again on Thursday for live Board Game Breakfast. We'll see you as time goes by throughout the week. Lots of cool videos. Folks, we have some great reviewers doing stuff. I mean, I know me and Z review a lot of things, but we have other people reviewing shows all throughout the week. We have all kinds of cool shows. We have other things in the Dice Tower Network. We're going to be starting a email list soon where we're going to try to tell you about some of this stuff. So keep tuned for that. We're still working on getting that together. Lots of exciting things. More top 10 special guests coming in the future. The, the future is bright and there's so many great games to talk about. But until then, I'll see you all next time. I'm Tom Vassell and this is Board Game Breakfast. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production.